How many of you have seen the movie Apollo 13? The reenactment of it with Tom Hanks and Kevin Bacon and you know, the whole big Hollywood production of it. And it shows aggression in it, people fighting with it. And the famous row with Gene Krantz where he said failure is not an option, which has been in countless uh, management um, scenarios. Okay? And um, they will tell you that that is complete bullshit. Okay? That there was no friction. Mission control to get us to the moon was done. Nobody raise your voice and get aggressive. They learnt very early on in mission control over the Mercury project that the moment that you allowed any aggression in, that you threaten anybody, you don't get the best out of them. I can't think. And I feel in South African management, this is a very important thing. You've got people who are at a disadvantage, and if you threaten them, and if you get angry, they're going to close down on you. One of the problems I think that is going on at SARS at the moment, one of the byproducts of SARS wars, is that everybody in SARS is too frightened to make a decision. What happens if I'm wrong? This advanced, um, this line of thought advanced in Apollo 11, the landing on the moon. Um, there, there are various misconceptions about that. They reckon that they chose Neil Armstrong to be the first man to walk on the moon purely because they knew he would not, he, he would land, land or crash. He would never give up, okay? And he was such a hard-ass shit that he would land it, and there was a special time for a special moment in that. Afterwards, you saw people become far more chatty about the whole thing. In Apollo 13, which had the disaster, nobody in all of that ever in reality lost their temper. Never. Okay? Uh, it's a fundamental of good management, is temper tantrums happen at home, preferably in the loo. But don't bring them to, um, to the work environment. What else can you learn from that? Is that if you drill something for long enough, it gets edged in your brain. The harder you work, the better that you get at it. Another one that you can earn, how old was that man when he did it? 27. The, on the day that they landed in the moon, the oldest man in the room was the flight controller, Gene Kratz. He was 36. Okay. And he threw all the politicians, the press, and everybody out of mission control. And he locked the door. He said to his people, we're in here as a team. Whether we crash a boat or land, we're coming out of here as a team. Don't worry about that. If you look at the actual moon landing video, it went wrong. They got all the computers got all uh, scrambled and all over the place. The guy in charge of the computers, I think, was 26. He was a little nerd with thick glasses. But billions of people around the world watching, and we've got one little nerd who's running it. And the amazing thing that they found in NASA at the time was that it was young people that did it. Average age of less than 30. They can do extraordinary things. And the danger that you have with King is that with all these regulations, it's too easy to pull the plug, abort on a decision. Okay? It's too easy to um, destroy creative ideas. It's too easy to dump on young people. And I use that word literally. Okay? Doesn't help anybody. What we should actually do in this program next year they're about, if you followed this in some detail and read all the books, in all the missions to get to the moon, there were about 10 of these incidents where things went fantastically wrong. And through good management, they saved the day every time. And what happened was, before they went to the moon, there was one of them that blew up, Apollo 8, on the ground, it killed three astronauts. They, they were just practicing, they were just drilling. And when they went back and they looked at what they were doing, they just rewrote the book on how you manage people. And when it came to the challenge of disaster, 
15 years later. So all that had happened is they hadn't read the book again. They'd forgotten it. They should never have flown that day. Um, but money got in the way. Personalities got in the way. And they blew it up. So yeah, it's extraordinary stuff. And you know, it just shows maybe, again, the Supremacy Act um, is gone out of all of this. Okay. So there's some things. Now, what we spoke about before lunch was the tax morality spectrum. We said, you always observe that, that you're not bullshitting, that you're straight and honest. One way of putting that is, can you look me straight in the eye and tell me that? Without blushing. In the profession, we call it Bloemfontein blush. Okay, if you can get Bloemfontein blush, you're going to have a problem. It doesn't go as far as this funny thing called substance over form. That doesn't apply. But then we have legislated behavior, um, the extent to which you can push a tax matter in terms of the general anti-avoidance regulations. Now, you can write a PhD about GAR. We've got to show how do we manage it. Am I going to lecture the whole thing to you? No. I'm going to show you what's there. It, it would be irresponsible to a degree for anybody but a true tax expert to work on assessing a GAR matter. But you've got to understand what the principle is. So the principle, very quickly, is to say, right, Section 80 talks about an impermissible tax arrangement. When have you pushed it too far? The idea of an impermissible arrangement triggers some consequences in terms of Section 80B. See, it's all got a, a structure to it. 80C is an expanding of the, prov of the provisions of 80A. They say if an, a, um, a transaction has an, a lax commercial substance, it will trigger 80A which will trigger ATB. And then ATC is further expanded in D, E, and F for specific transactions that we need to have a look at. Okay? So, can I take you through the drill again? It's a drill. Okay? We go like this. ATA says there are such things as impermissible tax arrangements, things you can't do. They trigger a consequence, ATB. ATC expands ATA as to what is an impermissible tax arrangement. And then D, E, and F are expansions of C to tell you when you lack commercial substance and therefore you have triggered an impermissible arrangement. All right? That's the guts of it. It carries on, but that's the big stuff. All of this stuff down the bottom here. Leave it out. That is the consequences of all of this. That's happened. If you trigger the thing, you should never, ever get there. What we are saying is, it starts off with what we are wanting to never get trapped with, is that we get trapped with an impermissible tax arrangement in a company. So what happens is we get to A. What is an impermissible tax arrangement? <coughs> there we have all the stuff. It says in the context of business, you have entered into a transaction which would not normally be carried out other than for bona fide business purposes. You've entered into a tax transaction. Okay? <coughs> so for bona fide business purpose. Or... It lacks commercial substance. Find out what commercial substance is by going to C. That is just a flip-through provision. And then there are other provisions which say the transaction has created rights and obligations of people who are not dealing at arm's length, okay, or would uh, frustrate the provisions of the Income Tax Act. So that's A. 
What B says is, in a lot of words, is what happens. And the part that you have to watch out there is the opening bit, which says, the commissioner may then make adjustments to eliminate the tax saving you've got. If you look at all of these provisions down the bottom here, they are just saying how the commissioner will do de deal with it. We never want to get there. What we're saying is that this thing in ATB says if you've got an impermissible tax arrangement, <coughs> the commissioner is given huge powers to then correct the transaction okay, and eliminate the tax saving. And this normally makes, is dealt with in terms of item two, the commissioner may make appropriate compensating adjustments that are necessary to have the consistent treatment of all parties. So that is B. What happens if you trigger A? C is then a expansion of the concept. You have created a structure that lacks business commercial risk. A feature of tax design is it wasn't done for commercial purpose. There's no commercial risk in it. You're running money all over the place. You're not at risk on the transaction, okay? Or the beneficial ownership of the asset is suspect. You don't need to have to go into these. It's all you're saying in C is that C is giving you characteristics of what is in a normal tax aggressive structure. And a normal tax aggressive structure involves um, a lack of commercial substance but it lacks, we go now to D, it has, they have consistent aspects to it. Round trip financing. Round trip financing means that money goes away from the taxpayer, it goes to another taxpayer, and it comes back to me in a different form. So the, 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 the easiest way of showing how that works is an example. It's a very crude example that used to happen very many years ago, involving Mauritius. What do we do? We go over to Mauritius with a briefcase. And we conclude a deal which says, I've got intellectual property here, and I'm going to place it and register it in Mauritius, and pay a royalty to from South Africa to Mauritius. The royalty would be deductible in South Africa as being an operating expense. In Mauritius, it is received by a company that is not taxed, because they don't have a tax rate there, and they immediately pay a dividend back to South Africa. So the money goes out and comes back. That is what is called round-trip financing. Okay? And that is an essential feature of a lot of tax mischief. Right? It went out and it came back. But it came back in a different form because the dividend is taxed at a lower rate. So that's D. And there are the expansions of D. You don't need to know the detail of it. In item C, you have an accommodating party. Now, in the first the example we've just used now, you would throw it to a foreign company in Mauritius who's got a lower tax rate than I've got. He would pay the tax on it at lower rate and send it back to me in a different form. He is the accommodating party. Okay? And it's just an entity with a lower tax rate than the principal entity. Now you can have this, for example, with a spouse. I'm working right and my spouse is not working if my spouse is not working she's not paying tax is she so i say hey instead of paying me pay my spouse she's become an accommodating party hasn't she because she's got a lower tax rate or another company with an assessed loss might be an accommodating party that it's mopping up past assessed losses and all the rest of it right and then we come to the final one which is so a term you need to know in tax, a connected person. A connected person is a relative. 
and watch out where you do any deals with relatives or any company that you or your relatives own or any trust of which you and your family are beneficiaries. That will trigger the connected persons test. So a connected person is an incestuous relationship in tax. If you have an incestuous relationship, it will trigger lack of commercial substance, it will set the transaction aside in terms of being an impermissible arrangement. Now that is as much as you need to know as a manager. Okay, those six blocks. There's a whole lot more, but don't worry about it. We're not even going there. Because if you land in that space, the first thing that you do is call for help. You call the nerd who has studied that for years and will tell you whether it is an impermissible arrangement or it isn't an impermissible arrangement. What you've basically got to say is if there's a tax proposal in front of me which involves a round trip or a lack of commercial substance or it looks suspicious or it's done with a relative and there's a tax saving resulting from it, call a nerd and get some help to show that you have taken reasonable care. That's all it's saying. That's all you do in management. You outsource the problem. So, hello, Matthew. Um, I've got a problem here. So now you've got to tell me what the problem is. And I've got to tell you, from my knowledge, whether it looks like it will survive Section 80 or whether it won't. Now, we'll come back to that a little bit later. Now we start on um, the next bit, which is the game of the Tax Administration Act. Now, today so far we have been talk talking about the Income Tax Act. In 2011, they brought in an act which regulates the interrelationship between the taxpayer and SARS. It's your Bill of Rights. When are you being bullied by a SARS official and when are you running the risk of being non-cooperative with SARS officials? And what the idea is, is in any tax matter, the rules to the game of tax are not in all the different, game, uh, different acts, income tax acts and the VAT Act and everything else. You say your rules to the game are in the administration provisions which are in a separate act. So, if you are the manager of tax, you leave the nerds to the actual taxing acts. The administration gives, the, the Tax Administration Acts gives you the framework as to how, who are the players to the game and how do you regulate the nerd that is dealing with your tax. Do you see that? And that is why in the context of an MBA, the administration of tax is more important than the taxation computations. Everybody thinks when they're coming on this course, I'm going to make you do tax comps. Never. You never get your hands dirty with those things. You send them to nerds. Okay? And tax is about delegation. Okay? I don't do my own e-filing. How many of you do your own e-filing? Of your own tax return? Okay, I don't. Why? I couldn't be bothered. I, for a hundred bucks, I can get somebody who administers my account, submits the tax return, and tells me if there's something wrong. Because it's a very rudimentary website that they're doing. Why should I waste my time and forget the codes and everything else? In an hour a year, I can pay somebody else to do it. It's the same as servicing a motor car. You can't service your own car anymore. It needs the right software and the right people to run it. So don't try, because you'll fuck it up even worse. <laughs> Delegate. All right? Uh, and this is an important aspect, because there's nothing worse. Can you imagine if somebody takes one of these modern bubble cars and puts a screwdriver in it? What's going to happen? They're going to do serious damage. 
because they didn't know what they were doing. So hire somebody, send it for a service. And this is an integral part of financial planning, which is rely on specialists. So, the, you know, in America, they've done this for years. They have what's called tax filing season. Tax consultants in America only work for six months a year. Because the deadline is so rigid and automatic that everybody's done it, everything's filed away, squared away, and the tax consultant after his six months goes fishing. I've tried to emulate that here, but it doesn't work, okay? Um, but we'll get there. <laughs> so who are the players in the game? So when you start on tax administration, you have to say, who are the players? And to understand that, you have to understand the government structure that you're working with. Right. Now this we've touched on already. Parliament is established in terms of a constitution. That then appoints a president. The president then appoints the SARS commissioner and the Minister of Finance. And there is your root of your problem. Huh? There's no nominations committee. There's no talent scout. Okay? Then, the minister runs national treasury and the commissioner and what's National Treasury's job? National Treasury's job, they are the economists. They just determine tax policy and the type of tax system that we need to get the money that we need for South Africa. That then goes to the Joint Standing Committee of Finance, who then recommend it to Parliament, that is your taxing act. Right. Can Mr. Gagaba look at my tax return? Hey, the Minister of Finance. Can Gagaba call for my tax return? No. no. <coughs> he can tell and legislate what tax table there is for the year, what the tax rules are, what should be in the Income Tax Act. The guy that goes and looks in my tax return and assesses it and audits it and administrates it is the SARS Commissioner. The SARS Commissioner then has two types of worker. A senior tax officer who has the teeth, who can authorize things, sign things off, etc. There are a few of them. A handful of them are across size. And then the rest of them are tax officers. Rank and file tax officers. So when you deal with SARS, you've got to know Am I dealing with a tax officer or am I dealing with a senior tax officer? That is an important part of, because although some tax officers think they've got teeth, their powers to actually make a decision are almost non-existent. Okay? Down to the fact that they are confined to <laughs> barracks during working hours, they are not even allowed to leave the building without, on, on tax matters without a letter of approval from a senior tax officer. So now we're looking at authorities, okay? So watch this. There is also another guy who floats around, the tax ombud. Now we think an ombud is a, a referee. That is a retired judge and he reports back to the, um, he goes and he can walk around SARS and look at cases, okay, and he reports back to the Minister of Finance as to what needs to be changed from an administrative aspect within SARS. So if you take the most recent thing that's happened with the tax ombud, do you remember in March people were saying SARS is delaying refunds to accelerate tax collection figures. And everybody started bitching about it. So they went to the tax ombud. And the tax ombud said, the level of complaints that I've received is now big enough that I want to conduct my inquiry into SARS and report to the Minister of Finance about what the hell are they doing? 
Okay, I don't know. Do you see how it's working? He is, if you want, the referee. Now, in the past, oh wait, we'll come to the powers of the tax on put in a moment. Let's carry on. So now we go and we say there are all the sections leading to the appointment and powers of tax officials. I'm not going to take you through them all because those are mainly authorities that the commissioner has to appoint people and give them the power, right? They're not the powers that concern you and me. That's really, if you look at that slide, the internal stuff in SARS. Okay? Now, there is also a provision in Section 7 that a SARS official must at all times avoid a conflict of interest situation. Same as us. Okay? Can a SARS official fuck up his mate's taxes? No. He's not allowed to touch a tax return of anybody that he knows. Now, years ago, um, I worked for the receiver of revenue before SARS in, in lieu of national service. But we still had to go and do basic training for a couple of weeks. And we had to have army haircuts. You know, a real full leather jacket. It was quite an amazing sight. And there was this absolute dickhead who was the army barber. Everybody, some mate of some sergeant major who had the right to charge us to physically assault us by doing it. This is why I've never had short hair ever since. I can't do it. He physically maimed me, this man. But don't worry, we got him back. Because when, when we went off to the receiver of revenue, we looked him up and we got him. Then he hadn't been declaring the haircut money. Now, <laughs> That's an example. Now, there are often, often insinuations of tip-offs in business. Somebody's got a mate at SARS. He can stuff you up. Um, and people threaten you with SARS. Okay? Now, watch out for this. Because one of the most common things that we see with fraud in businesses is that it is a long-established employee who's been in the business watching you for years. Oh, you're doing that one and you're doing this one. And the day that you catch them, what's the first thing they say? Is They say, if you take this any further, I'm going to rat on you to SARS. Divorce cases. All sorts of shit gets reported to SARS all the time. Some of it true, some of it not true. But it's, there is a huge potential for conflict around Skinner reporting whistleblowing. Okay? You've even got a whistleblowing number on the front of the SARS website. They say, if you see any suspicious activity, tell us about it. You say, look outside your building into the informal gray sector. They're right on your doorstep. What are you doing about it? Focal. But that, the provision is there. Okay? So they're the senior tax officers. Number one, a tax, no tax officer. Their basic rules about them being out of their office. And they're people who run around and masquerade as revenue officials. They go into business and they say, I'm from SARS. Give me 5,000 bucks and I will take you off the list of my inspections. And everybody goes, fuck, get 5,000 bucks quick. He wasn't from SARS in the first place. <laughs> it's a straight, off the street fraudster who just took you for five grand. It happens every day. Okay, people are so frightened of SARS that the formal procedure with SARS is that in any interaction with a SARS official identity cards please they have to be carrying a valid identity card otherwise you don't talk to them but there's an even further quality control now that is not legislated but it is practice 
No SARS official is, um, tax officer is allowed out of the building without somebody with him. They have to travel in twos. So if one comes in with an identity document and says, I'm from SARS, so that's very funny. That looks suspicious because you're not allowed out of your box without two of you. Come back with another identity card and a mate. And then I might talk to you. I might. All right? So, and, and a, a common or gotten SARS official will respect that. He knows it. He's trained about that. He's supposed to walk through the door and say, here we are. First thing that they're supposed to produce in an inquiry. Next. These, that, that's an internal one, nine. Delegations don't worry about, civil actions don't worry about, and court appearances don't worry about. That is all for SARS to worry about. Those are their own authorities to act internally. You don't have to worry about it in the public eye. Right. Now, so we're saying, no identity crisis, you're out. The finger. Cheers. Now we go to National Treasury. And this is where the frustration hit boiling point on the Godan issue. Godan was adamant, and there is a clash between the interpretation of the Tax Administration Act and the SARS Act, as to who appoints the commissioner. Magashula, remember him yesterday? The guy who didn't achieve the di dot in the eye of the word shit? Okay. He was appointed by Godan. I went to meetings there where he called Gordon boss. When technically he's appointed by the minister. When Mignani came along, he said, Gordon is not my boss. I report to the president. And there's a clash there, which is a gaping void in the legislation. Please will you show us the process to appoint a commissioner. Obviously, some people don't want that to change. Others think it would be just be a matter of following King Four, which says there has to be a nominations committee. Right? Even for the chairman. Do you see how the act is deficient on King Four? Right. So, the Minister of Finance may then delegate to his staff at National Treasury. They are determining the strategic direction of South Africa, okay? And we have all sorts of provisions regarding to the ombud as well, okay, as to how far can the ombud go, because he's the only one that is allowed to go and sniff around in SARS's offices. National Treasury officials are not allowed to do that. He can sniff around as to what's going on at SARS. And all the provisions here are giving him that authority. So, yeah, he's there. He's got limited powers. There they are all down there. You don't need to know what they are. Okay? And then the minister reports back to Parliament <coughs> once a year. Part, so now, those are your tax officials. Next is, what are you obliged in terms of law as a taxpayer to keep? And when must you register? <coughs> So registration goes like this. It is governed in terms of Section 22 of the Tax Administration Act. It says, you are responsible to communicate with SARS. So if somebody says, I'm not registered, I'm waiting for them to catch up with me. No. The Tax Administration Act puts the emphasis on the taxpayer to come forward. They're not going to send out... Um, the, the way that it works is that they, they used to send you a tax return and you had to respond to SARS. No, it's changed now. There is a public proclamation once a year, it's tax return time. And it's up to you to and make yourself available to be taxed, <coughs> to volunteer your tax. It's not up to SARS to find you. Isn't that nice? Okay, and you the moment that you have got income, 
You must communicate with SARS within 21 business days. You must apply for a tax number. And this is where, if one looks in the, gray, in the informal gray sector, there's no tax number, no tax return. There are some incredible statistics for those of you who've seen your IT3 on your tax return. Your IT3 on your tax return shows what's the year in balance of your tax account, how much interest did you earn, okay, and what were the debits and credits in your account. That is all information that is transmitted to SARS. Now, there are something like 80 million um, bank accounts in South Africa. Even with FASE and FICA and tax returns, today only half of them can be tracked to the person who owns them by SARS. Isn't that incredible? Now, millions of those are inactive, got nothing in them, there's no money for SARS. But when you say informal sector, taxation of the informal sector, now that's an interesting one. Informal sector is normally a cash business, right? But that's changed now. Everybody wants a bank card today, even in the informal sector. We don't want to carry cash around, we will get assaulted. I want a bank card. Except the taxes. No, it's not. They've been trying for years to get the taxis right, my friend. That you can swipe a card on taxi. Why don't the cards, they want cards in taxis? They could track it. They want cash. So, how do we get to the informal sector? We don't have to go and find them physically in townships. We have to go and say, where are the bank accounts with the activity in them? Dredge it by a computer interrogation program. That will give you a short list of what to go and look for. Do you see? Right. Now, submission of tax returns. Once a year, SARS comes out, it's normally on the 1st of July, and they say, it's tax season. You have got until such and such a time to submit your return. For most it's November, for provisional tax payments it's January, for provisional taxpayers it's January of the following year. But notice, there's a public notice, it's tax season. SARS goes further, they put it out in the news and everything else, it's tax season. They are following section 25 and 26, which says they've got to make an announcement. Tax returns are due. So if you've got a tax return, you better do it. They may also require other returns of businesses. So the, if you look at the season that we are in now, they are in PAYE reconciliation season. Those are the returns required by the employers, where they send you all the data. That's why when you get your tax return back, it's already got your IRP5s on it because your employers have uploaded to SARS and SARS have pre-populated your, your, your tax return. So for many people, the submission of the tax return is, oh, okay, submit. Okay. Do you know that on the first day of filing season, it always comes out from SARS, we filed a million tax returns in a day. How does that happen? Does that mean the public went out there and all suddenly filled in their tax return. No, it's all the people who are running, uh, all the tax advisors, who've got a backlog of them, who want to file the whole lot so that they can build the work. Okay? That's why they're getting the stuff in, so that they can say to the client, oh, I put your tax return in, I got an immediate assessment, here's your assessment, here's my bill, now pay. That's why it's there. Next, how long do you have to keep records? Section 29. The bottom line is five years from the date of submission of your tax return. You have to keep that information handy. Now, in your personal tax life, that shouldn't be too much of a problem 
because it's already on the tax return and there's nothing to add. If they need anything more from the banks, they can give you five years of statements at a click of a button. Okay? Um, so that's a reasonable period. Now I'm asking a question. How far can SARS go back on tax evasion? Technically to 1961. Okay? They generally don't do that because you don't have the records. You're not required to keep the records for more than five years unless you've been instructed to do so. Okay? So the general rule is that you will keep your records for five years. Now, this is something where I say to people, he has a little bit of technology to have assistance. Open a Gmail account for all your tax matters. And when your tax assessment arrives, etc., go forward to your tax file so that it's stored on the cloud. So when you need it, you don't have to go and dredge through a million emails. You've got a separate email account for it, for all my financial matters. When your IT3 comes from the bank or your receipt for your pension fund contribution, control forward. You always know where it is. Okay? And you don't keep it with all your other stuff. That way you don't lose the papers. Is there an excuse anywhere in this thing that says, you've lost the papers. SARS must be sympathetic. No. They can come across to you and say, I'm not interested. Go and get them. And that becomes the biggest bugbear in tax, which is the recovery of information. Big problem. Okay, so you keep your records for five years. Okay, and they say you can keep it in electronic form. Okay, that's all fine. Now, inspection of records. The records must be kept open for inspection um, by SARS. Now, this, we, there are caveats to this. Okay, they can also request that you keep your papers for longer than five years if there's a tax dispute a tax dispute can take 10 years to resolve often does so once you've received an inquiry you keep it i say to people don't destroy it because the moment that you destroy it there'll be a technical issue just because of murphy's law so just keep dumping to the email account they can even ask your papers to be translated um, at your expense now comes the inspections. When can SARS come and inspect you? Right. Selection for inspection. Notice I'm going to come back to section 72 later about the Promotion of Access to Information Act. SARS may select you for audit on any basis that they want. And this is part of the thing with the rogue unit. What are we saying? If Gordon wanted information, read section 40. Go and get the information. They can select who they want. The Promotion of Access to Information Act is for when there is mischief around. So if you suddenly have a row with your lover and she says, I'm going to report you to SARS, and two weeks later, a great big inquiry arrives from SARS and you say, oh, bugger it, she did. <laughs> you have the right, there's a procedure for it, to ask SARS what they've got on you and they've got to tell you who ratted on you. That is done through the Promotion of Access to Information Act, okay, but do you do it all the time? No. You do it when there is genuine mischief around, Okay, and I wouldn't do it without pro professional help. But this whole business of, is there something untoward? Are you suspicious of their behavior? Do you, suddenly, something's gone wrong and all the rest of it? There is a remedy. Now, inspection. Can SARS walk into your house? Can they knock on your door? Sorry? Yes, senior tax official. Well, uh, 
Watch how it works, it's very careful. There are different levels of inspection. There's what's called a walkabout. It often happens at the Grahamstown Festival. SARS officials walking about. You've never seen so many caravans leave this town as when that happens, okay? Ooh, SARS is here. I remember years ago, it was quite funny, our Provengo Don set up a walkabout around the Bruma Lake flea market. But the word got out he was on his way. Hey, everybody closed down, fucked off very quickly, okay? <laughs> and he was just trying to do it in a good faith manner. But what was, what's interesting about this is, yes, you can be a street vendor and a guy comes up to you and says, I'm from SARS. Right, first response? ID, please. Where's your wingman? ID, please. <laughs> right. What do you want? He says, I want to conduct an audit. Answer? On what? Fuck off. <laughs> no. He may only ask, where, is this your business? Where, whose identity is it? Is it registered for tax? He cannot, at that point, ask for your books and records. He is just gathering information. So if a sales official threatens you, arrives unannounced, you can say, oh, I'm not talking to you. Here's my ID document, here's my tax number, now bugger off. And do you notice here, a SARS official may never enter the dwelling home. Coming back to that dope judgment the other day. Your home is your castle. You have constitutional rights on it. Tax inspectors are not allowed in there and you are allowed to grow a little bit of twack in the back garden. Okay? Those are fundamental human rights in this country. Okay? Important. Then, a SARS official may also ask you for copies of records. Okay? So they can say, they can ask a taxpayer or any person connected with a taxpayer within a reasonable time to submit material, either orally or in writing. That is a letter from SARS, a letter of inquiry. It gets posted to your email account, to your SARS account. You get an email, there's something requiring attention. Here's a query. Please submit the following information. <coughs> right? But that is not an inspection. That is just requesting information. Any SARS official can do that. Ask for information. But they can't come to your house and demand it at the door. They've got to send you a letter of inquiry with a reasonable amount of time for you to get the information together <coughs> and then you submit it to SARS. They're not allowed to bulldoze you. Not yet. Now, next up. They may also ask you to send that information in in a sworn affidavit format. Doesn't often happen. Okay, next up. Production of the material. Right? They can also ask you to produce the material and come and answer some questions at SARS. Now that is the point at which I think you should talk to a consultant. Okay? Because I know I've been a tax inspector. We know exactly what questions to ask, what buttons to push. Okay? So be careful in what you're required to answer those questions. The problem that happens <laughs> is now in your business, you, you know, the, the bookkeeper goes running off to SARS to be interviewed <laughs> and tells them a whole lot of rubbish. And then all hell breaks loose, okay? We had a wonderful one while I was working at SARS. These are just old SARS stories. About, we had a, a guy that worked for me, Halley was useless. But one Monday morning, he comes in all energized. He was like a Duracell bunny. And what's he got? He's got the back page of the old Sunday Times that used to have all the sex scandals on it. And here is a, a woman who's got two Porsches. So he ran off. He's going to investigate this. Where does this woman get the money from to get? 
And boy, he was back in the office with her a couple of hours later. And she says, well, actually they're not mine. They're my boyfriends, he's got 12. <laughs> Stupid, okay? Um, so you don't want the wrong people representing you with us. Who represents the taxpayer? So if a request comes in to your business which says provide information and come and be interviewed, will you please make sure that the right person who has the answers goes to answer the questions? So now we start off with saying there is a channel in our risk management for saying who's responsible for what. And we must say if there's an inquiry from SARS, that's got to trigger off an internal process which says that it is properly addressed by people who are authorized by the board or the risk committee to communicate with SARS. The last thing we want is a note or sending the wrong information to SARS or getting the wrong end of the stick or worse still, what happens in a lot of businesses is an inquiry arrives and oh, I don't like the look of that. Let's tear it up and maybe it'll go away. That never works anymore. It used to work in the past, but it doesn't work anymore. Right. SARS can extend the period for providing information and they can ask you for other information as well. Now, when this has been one of the big criticisms of SARS in the past is that they, they would ask for information and then they'd go away and you'd never hear from them again. But you didn't know whether the matter was resolved or not resolved. I don't know whether you've had it happen with your tax return, it happens with me every year. Tax return goes in, almost immediately they ask for information. They want your RA certificates, your interest certificates, da, 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 da. you send it back to SARS. They then have to, within 21 business days, send you a notice, are they escalating the matter, or can you consider the matter closed? Because you don't want to sit there on tenterhooks for the rest of your life. So when you upload that information, they've got 21 days. They've either got to say, we're going to take it further, or they're going to close the file for the time being. But they have to communicate back to you. We haven't even gotten to the sports yet. Okay? Now, authorization, now it starts to get hairy. There. Now this is where SARS officials come out of the office. Okay? In fast cars on foot. They are not doing a walkabout. They are now coming to, um, to, to conduct a field audit or investigation. Can they pitch up at your door and say, we are here to do a field audit or investigation? No. Number one, they may not leave their offices to do an audit without a letter from a senior SARS officer. I actually had this last year with a SARS team in Aberdeen, up near Grafrenet. A farmer phones me and says, I've got tax inspectors here. So I say, um, okay, they've arrived unannounced. I said, have they got a letter of introduction? He says, no. So, turn the fuck off. Now they get cross, right? But they are the ones that have not followed the procedure. They're not allowed out of their cage without the authorization <laughs> of the, their boss. And they've got to produce their letter of authority. Wait, we're going to go further. And look at that. There is item three. The, the public are entitled to assume that they're not a SARS official. So tell them to go away. So now the lot go bugger off back to Port Elizabeth. Very pissed off because they were SARS officials. Okay. But they must follow the procedure. But wait, it gets better. They, have, they appeared the next week. 
And I said, no, you've got to send the letter in advance and make an appointment. <laughs> you've got to give me 10 business days notice that you're coming. I've got better things to do. This guy's got goats to attend to, man. <laughs> You can't just pitch up here when you feel like it. So go back to Port Elizabeth and give me notice and come back in 10 days time. Funny enough, that was the last time we ever heard of them. <laughs> so they now, we now know that they're coming. Right? And we can even go as far as to say, right, it's got to be a normal business hours. They've got to tell you the initial scope of what they're going to do. That's just a common courtesy. What information? You can't just arrive here and say, I'm here to audit. You're here to audit what? Income tax, VAT, PAYE. Please put it all out in the letter signed by your boss, the senior SARS official. Make an appointment, bring your identity cards. Now, this is not grand folk when you, when you do this. This is the procedure, this is a serious matter, you want to access to my box, you must give me the initial scope, and by the way, okay, I, I can, a person can waive the right, these rights, but you can, within five days of the receipt of the report, say to them, look, no, sorry pals, I'm busy on that day that you want to come, please reschedule. Now, do that by all means, but don't get bloody minded, because then, if you've got the notice that they want to come along, cooperate. There is nothing worse to set off a SARS official than an uncooperative taxpayer. Okay? But cooperation does not mean that you can go in the bedroom. Your dwelling home is secret. No behind the green doors in tax. Now, <laughs> this one I love. Now they've come to visit you and they, they say, you must give them appropriate facilities, answer their questions, give them the relevant officials. You must not obstruct them, you must not refuse them. And the old days, what we used to do with this was by 11 o'clock we'd have the <coughs> SARS officials in a pub for a very boozy lunch and they seemed to have a habit of disappearing um, shortly afterwards. That was the way you dealt with in the past. Understand this. Have you, what, have you ever worked for somebody who has a zero gifts tolerance policy? Gordon has installed that at SARS. Uh, you, I, I've known SARS officials for my whole working career. Same people. I cannot even buy them a cup of coffee across the road while we have a chat about a taxpayer matter. Nothing. Parliament, parliamentarians can receive gifts providing they put them in a gifts register. Right? A SARS official, a cup of coffee is potentially a bribe. But you've got to make them, give them appropriate facilities. Oh, now that's interesting. So we've got to give him a boardroom. Does it mean you've got to give him coffee and jelly donuts? You might risk the coffee, not the jelly donuts, right? Because you are working on a zero tolerance gift policy. You're certainly not going to take him out to lunch. Right? Now, there, there's some funny things about this. Um, years ago, there used to be a cosmetics company in Joburg called Reva Foreman. Apparently, she kept the SARS official waiting in reception the whole day. And they gave up. In, they gave up in the end and left. That's one way of, it's not going to work. Okay, that, that's what you did years ago. I've seen other people make sure that they only use the loo on the other end of the building and that the office that they're in has got an air conditioner stuck on very hot. Um, uh, that's all the silly stuff. I'm just trying to lighten up an afternoon's work here. Okay. You've got to be cooperative, and firm cooperation is fine. You've got to give them the use of the photocopier. But if they start overdoing it, you can actually say that they've got to pay for their photocopies. Then they've been on your house looking around. They can't, they've conducted an investigation. 
They then have to report to you regularly about the state of completion of your audit. They are not allowed to go away, put away their files, and contact you a year later and say, regarding our audit. Upon conclusion, they then come back to you and they say, these are our findings. Okay? That's a completion or a conclusion letter prior to raising any assessments. What is it? It's an invitation for you to say, hey, that's wrong. You've come to the wrong conclusion. Now, when the letter of findings arrives, often in businesses, it doesn't go any further because somebody puts it in drawer 13. And SARS doesn't hear from the taxpayer, so they raise an assessment. What we have to say is that is a very critically important piece of paper. If you get a letter of findings and they're threatening to do something, take action now before they raise the assessment. Because once they've raised the assessment, you will see just now that we've got to move heaven and earth through a whole set of compliance procedures to get the assessment withdrawn. Then, a, SAR, a senior SARS official can refer a case for criminal investigation. Now notice, SARS cannot criminally prosecute you as a taxpayer. If you've done something criminal, they have to refer it to the national prosecuting authorities. The national prosecuting authorities then make a decision as to whether they are to press charges or not. In the past, uh, tax inspectors could just phone up their mates at the cops and say, arrest so-and-so, and, -so, and do it on a Friday afternoon so you won't back make bail till Monday. In other words, we're threatening taxpayers. SARS can't do that. They've got to do it through the Office of the National Prosecution Authorities. Any criminal charge. Okay? Now, so what are we saying? You get selected for audit under Section 40. There can be a records inquiry conducted on the street. Have you got records? Nothing further. Taxpayer responses, 45 is important. Taxpayer response to inquiry. SARS then comes back and says, you've responded, we're happy, end process, but they've got to notify you that the process has ended. Okay? A written inquiry, you have a written inquiry, the taxpayer responds, you can have an interview with SARS, then there is a decision made by SARS. Do we raise an assessment or don't we? Or is this matter of such severity that we have to inform the NPA? Okay, in which case a senior tax officer is the only person who can take that decision. So, and then on an audit, you get selected for audit, you have to have an authority before the audit can continue. Taxpayer has to be given notice that they're coming. You then conduct the audit. You have a letter of the findings. Taxpayer must then respond. Then there is an assessment decision. Now, all of these things, we've got to check that everybody's behaving properly. So what we've got to have is a collection point through the risk committee. If there is any correspondence from SARS, the following risk control procedures come into play to manage it. That's the important take home from that. Okay? Don't worry about inquiry orders, we never see them. Now this is the sensational stuff. We're doing a raid. <coughs> Okay, now, I'd never examine this because, of course, you guys are never going to have a raid. <laughs> unless it's a phony one, somebody trying to threaten you. When the Tax Administration Act was promulgated, SARS wanted the right to search and seizure. They said a senior tax officer must be able to say, right, off we go. Parliament had a free cut about it. They said that's suspicious. That's Gestapo behavior. So, if they now, there are times now in serious matters where you can't get hold of taxes, 
that they have to go and raid the premises to get the information. That what they have to do is they have to apply to a magistrate or a judge for a warrant to do a, a raid. They can't, not even SARS, can authorize a midnight raid without notice. They have to go to a magistrate and the magistrate has to review their application, issue a warrant, then they can raid. They were furious about this because they say, jeepers, look at all the extra work we've got to do before we can do a raid. Okay? And so they've got to justify to a magistrate that they need a warrant to conduct a raid. They've got to conduct the raid within 45 days of the warrant being issued or apply for another one. So what happens, what happens if SARS inspectors arrive at my house tonight? I say, hang on, no appointments, fuck off. We've got a warrant. <laughs> oh, really? Show it to me. Is the, no, it's not really a warrant. It's an instruction from a senior tax officer. <laughs> fuck off. You've got to give your, make an appointment in normal business hours. If you want to do anything outside of business hours, get a warrant, go and see a magistrate. Now, fuck off. <laughs> Okay, now these things, I'm, de I'm being ridiculous, it's a Sunday afternoon, okay, but I'm trying to press home the point that SARS officials don't have carte blanche to do what the hell they like. Some might give that impression, but your taxpayers' rights are, the right to privacy is entrenched in tax administration, and a warrant in a warrant application to the magistrate, he's got to look at it and see it. why should he give them a warrant? Okay, why, what's this taxpayer done that guarantees that you should arrive there at two o'clock in the morning? What's the threat to South Africa? Only if there's a threat to the nation and the taxpayer has been uncooperative, would a warrant ever be issued? And then, ladies and gentlemen, even if you've got a warrant, they must produce the warrant. There is a way of dealing with it. They've got to give you a receipt for everything that they take in your books and records. Okay. So there's a whole process that's got to be gone through. Okay. They've got to carry out the search with decency and order. This is not a Doppler raid. They can bring the police with them if they want to. You may not obstruct the SARS official. Okay. And you may also actually now search without a warrant. There actually is no such thing as search without a warrant. They've got to have a warrant to conduct a search. This extension provision, section 62, only applies when there is a part of the premises that during the warrant wasn't on the warrant. Then only a senior tax officer can enter it, but he can't enter the bedroom. Okay? again. So search and seizure. Okay, you, oh wait, don't worry about that one. Search and seizure. Identity cards, please. A valid warrant. Okay, they may only go in terms of the rules on the warrant. Okay, if they want to extend the warrant for further premises, a senior tax officer may. You can get, even if they take all your books and records, you have always got the right to ask for copies. And in terms of 66, at the end of the investigation, they have to return your records. Right. Have you had enough for today? Yes. Okay, you've also got a lot of work to do because you've got two parts to your assignment tomorrow. I think we've done a lot of time on our feet for today. We can finish this off tomorrow after presentations. There is one caveat, however, to being me being so very nice to you now that there is a, in the, the movies that I've given you, there is a basic introduction to VAT that you need to look at. You don't have to be an expect, an, a specialist in the VAT system, but you need to know the basics of a VAT system, how VAT is collected. There is a video for you to have a look at there that you can look at in your own time. It doesn't have to be tonight, but it is part of the syllabus.
Right. We'll pick up at part three again tomorrow. Thank you for a long day. Yeah.